And once again, I want to welcome you to Calvary, and I want to welcome you back to Step by Step, and I want to remind you that the purpose of Step by Step is for us to become more familiar with our Bibles so that we can become better students of the Bible. Our approach is to provide an overview of each book of the Bible, and thus far, we've made it to the book of Judges. Now, the, some of us, we, we like stories that have happy endings. We like stories where the heroes are clearly heroes and the villains are clearly villains. We don't mind a story that has a little bit of romance in it, but we certainly want a story where everything is resolved in the end. This is not your story. But if you're looking for a story that'll change your life, you're looking for a story that will equip you to be used by God in whatever backdrop the world might look like, this is a story for you. The book of Judges is perhaps, uh, the, the storyline of the book of Judges, perhaps one of the most important, I'd say even essential um, for us if we're gonna be effective for the kingdom of God in the, in, in the world backdrop that we currently live in. The book of Judges is the seventh book of your Bible. Uh, it has 21 chapters. It has just north of 600 verses. It can be read in, you know, if you, in you know, maybe 45 minutes to an hour. Um, it covers, uh, well, it's in addition to being the seventh book of the Bible, it's the second book of the historical section. And it covers a period of roughly 400 years. So when the book of Judges begins, we have Israel, they have entered into the promised land. They have defeated 31 different kings. They have um, divided the land up into these 12 sections, a section for each tribe. And the leadership now of the nation has transitioned from Joshua to the tribes themselves. And so we had in, in Exodus and following, the leader of the nation was Moses. Moses transitioned that to Joshua, and now Joshua transitions, disperses it among the 12 tribes. So that's what's happening as the book begins. 400 years later, when, a book, when the book comes to its end, we have Israel on the brink of the monarchy period. So it will carry us from the time of Joshua all the way until that time where Israel will choose for themselves a king. Saul will sit as the first king upon the throne of Israel. He will later be um, replaced by David and the Davidic dynasty will begin that will continue all the way till the end of 2 Chronicles. And so this is that book that fills the gap between the time Israel enters into the land and the time when the kingdom is established. Um, the uh, book of Judges is, it's unlike Deuteronomy and Joshua where those books claim their authorship. Deuteronomy claims to have been written by Moses. Joshua claims to have been written by Joshua. Uh, the book of Judges does not provide us any internal um, insight into the specific author of the book. There are some hints that help us to get there. We know that the book of Judges was written during the monarchy period. We know that because there are four references in Judges to, at this time, there was no king in Israel. So we know at the time of its writing, there was a king to contrast that against. We also know that the book of Judges was written while the Jebusites still controlled Jerusalem. And David is the king. In fact, one of his first acts as king was to defeat and take the city of Jerusalem. So we know the time period for the book of Judges when it was written has to be the time in which Saul was king which has caused most, and going way back, as far back as we can go, tradition is that Samuel is the author of this book. 
So Samuel's the author. Uh, it's been attributed to him. There's no reason for us to question that tradition. Samuel wrote the book. Now, Judges is the way it's written is different than what we've seen in Genesis through Joshua. Genesis through Joshua carry a continual storyline forward. What I mean by that is, is that when you read in Genesis chapter 15, that means the events of Genesis 12 have already happened and the events of Genesis 20 haven't happened yet. Does that make sense? So it's written kind of in chronological order. It carries an idea forward. The book of Judges is not like that. It covers a 400 year period of time. However, when you get to Judges 21 verse 25, that's the last verse in the book, you are not 400 years farther downfield than you were at Judges chapter 1 verse 1. It's not presented just as chronological timeline. Instead, Samuel is telling a story, and Samuel has, has maybe a primary purpose in the story that he's telling. And that primary purpose might be this. He might be wanting to instruct us of the, of the devastating effects of sin. When you read through the book of Judges, you read all the stories as they develop, one of the primary thoughts at the end is sin is destructive. Sin is deadly. Another way of putting that is um, a person who rejects the Word of God, the ways of God, the authority of God, that person will have devastating effects come upon their lives. It's true of a person, it's true of a people or a congregation, and it's true of a nation the devastating effects of sin. Um, sin makes promises to you. It promises you pleasure. It promises you satisfaction. It promises in some way to enhance or improve your current circumstances. So that if you do something that's outside the boundaries of God, it's promising to give you something. The thing about sin is it's incapable of keeping those promises. Because sin has a very, uh, uh, sin has a nature, and the nature of sin is to be destructive. Sin, it's sin, similarly, water has a nature. Anything that touches water gets what? Wet. Is there, is, is there any um, exemption to that? If, you, if something touched something with water, it gets wet. When I was a child, I, you know, I, I can remember being at a public pool. And when I'm outside of the water, I'm dry. When I'm inside the water, I'm wet. And guess what? So are the bathers sitting next to the pool because I would aim for them. The only thing, the only benefit that they had was that I was so small, I didn't make that much of a splash. But we would work on it. We would practice ways to land in the water that would increase the splash and even direct the splash. Do some of you have done the same things? Right? So you have the cannonball or whatever the different shapes that you put your body in in order to land in such a way to push water because you're hoping to irritate people and get them and their things wet because water has a nature. Does that make sense? Sin also has a nature. The nature of sin is that it is destructive. Paul put it like this in Romans chapter 6. He said, the wages of sin is death. There's, sin will return something to you. What it will return to you is death, death and destruction. James said in a very similar way, James said that a, a person is enticed, when, they, when a person is tempted, they're enticed, they're drawn towards sin. And then he said, and when sin is full grown, it brings forth death. It can't do anything else. Now, we, because of our fallen nature, we believe that ourself, our circumstances, or our sin is the exception. And that somehow I can participate in this particular action and it's not gonna bring destruction or death into my life. And so James goes on and says this. He says, do not be deceived, brethren, because it's our basic nature to deceive ourselves about the nature of sin. And so there's this, this, this theme 
throughout the book of Judges that Samuel is he's painting the picture. Page after page after page, he's reminding us of the devastating nature of sin. And this sin has an impact upon the nature. There's a, things happen during this 400 year period of time. Um, it, affects, it affects the nation of Israel. There are four things that seem to be um, repeated throughout the book. Number one, this sin has affected the nation in that the nation has been weakened. The nation is weakened. At the time of Joshua, they'd come in together collectively. They had defeated the Canaanites. 31 different kings were defeated. Great obstacles were standing in front of them, like the walls of Jericho or the chariots of, of King Jabin. And now this same people group is being defeated. We see them being defeated by the nations around them. Well, in the book of Judges, the Sumerians or Mesopotamians from the north, also the Sidonians from the north, will oppress Israel. On their eastern border, they'll be oppressed by Ammon and Moab and the Amalekites. On their southern border, they'll be oppressed by the Midianites. Within their borders, they'll be oppressed by the Canaanites, by the Jebusites, and by the Philistines. There's just constant oppression. The nation is weakened. The second thing that we see in the book as a result of this sin is that there is spiritual confusion within the nation. We're going to read in the book of Judges about the people practicing idolatry. One thing we'll read about is that they practice idolatry by embracing the false gods of the nations around them or, or the peoples that had lived in Canaan. So we read about them worshiping Baal and Ashtoreth. But more commonly than that in the book is a form of what we might call synchronism, where they take the true and living God, and then they take basic character traits or worship practices from the surrounding nations, and they combine those things together. And so we read about them, them referring to God, the real God of Scripture, and, we, and them praying, and them quoting Scripture. But then their practices and their description of God is, is marred by an influence of the world that's around them. In fact, in the closing chapters of the book, there's a story where a man, a woman, takes money and has an idol built. And they set this idol up in their home. And then her son creates a whole fake religion based upon this idol and makes one of his sons the priest of this idol. And then later, they meet a Levite and they hire him to be the priest of their homemade religion. And that this isn't happening in the nations around Israel or to the people groups who still remain in the land. This is happening with the children of Israel, spiritual confusion. This synchronism is a very common problem today. When we've traveled in, in uh, the northern part of, of Ghana and into sort of the, the more tribal areas that people are animal, animists, worshiping various uh, forms of, of gods. Uh, it, there's kind of a, a standing line that you hear among the Christians in those settings. They'll say, this area here is 50% Christian, 30% Muslim, and 100% animist. And this region over here is 80% Muslim and 10% Christian and 100% animist. Because the idea is that they've accepted the God of Scripture, but they're still worshiping their idols, they're still sacrificing animals to their idols, they're still going to the fetish priest when there's issues going on in their life. So there's an embracing of God, but also a behaving just like the world around them. And that's not just a pagan problem, is it? That may be the number one problem with our Christianity, is that we shape God into our own image rather than allowing God to shape us into His. And so there's this spiritual confusion. The third problem and fourth that is presented within the book 
First is the weakness of the nation. The second is the spiritual confusion. The third would be a moral decline that then would result in the fourth, which would be social unrest. And as we read through the book of Judges, we're going to read things like about how there are certain highways in the country that are not safe to travel on. There's, there's dangerous people on those highways. We're going to read about certain cities that are dangerous and you can't go into. We're going to read about certain parts of certain cities where it's not safe to be at night. We read about theft. We're going to read about murder. We're going to read about uh, human trafficking, about prostitution, about rape, homosexuality. There's even an attempted genocide, an attempt to wipe out an entire tribe of the nation of Israel. This is all happening. There's this moral decline happening within the nation that is resulting in unrest throughout the nation to where not only is Israel fighting against trying to get out from under the oppression of the Mesopotamians in the north and Ammon and Moab in the east and the Midianites from the south and the Canaanites and Philistines and Jebusites within the land, but they're fighting amongst themselves. There's such moral decline within the nation. Now, all that being said, what's the title of this book? Judges. Now, that title is somewhat misleading only because the image that is painted in our head because of the English word judge is not the same image that would be painted in our head by the Hebrew word that was used in its context here. When we think of a judge, we think of a person presiding over a courtroom or over a contest. And probably in in many of our cases, that's not something that we necessarily have positive feelings about. I would say, man, last time I was before the judge, he dismissed the case that I was trying to make, or worse than that, he brought the gavel down and I spent the night somewhere I didn't want to sleep, right? So that's not probably a positive thing, you think of the judge. Or we think of the contest, and we think, all my friends told me that I did way better than that person did. I got a four and they got a six, five. They won, I lost, right? And we have these feelings because of the judges. That's not how the word judge is used here. The word judge is used here. Uh, A better equivalent would be the word deliverer, deliverer or rescuer. I think we have different feelings about a deliverer. You're in a situation, you're doing a project at home, you started it, you've realized your skill set, your resources, you're never going to be able to finish it. And then what happens? A deliverer shows up, right? Your friend shows up with all those skills. It's like, praise the Lord. (laughs) Thank you, God. And then you finish it and you tell your friends the work you did, right? (laughs) Or your car breaks down on the side of the road at night and you're like, I don't know what I'm going to do. This is terrible. And then a deliverer shows up. Or your, or your boat capsizes and the deliverer shows up. Or you're, you get caught in that riptide and the deliverer shows up. There's a whole different visual there, isn't there? Like the, the idea of a judge, I go, I'm not sure that that excites me very much. But wait, 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 wait. A group of people who are living in a nation that's been weakened, where there's spiritual confusion, there's, there is moral decline, There's social unrest, and God is going to raise up deliverers? I like the idea of that. That, This attracts me. I think there might be something. It would be very difficult for us, just even just in a a general sort of uh, perusal of the situation in the book of Judges, not to recognize the parallels between the world that we live in today. And what's this book about? Deliverers. That's what the book's about. In fact, as a result of the, uh, well, the title has been given to the book because the main body of this book tells the story of 12 men and women in that backdrop that God calls and equips in order to deliver the nation from oppression. That's a great story, isn't it? 
That's exciting, and that's exactly what God wants to do today. God wants to call and equip men and women, regardless of the backdrop of the social scenario that's going on around us, God wants to call and equip men and women to rescue and redeem fallen people out of their sin and into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what this book's going to teach us. This is an exciting book. As a result, the deliverers in this book become sort of a foreshadowing of the work that God ultimately does in the person of Jesus Christ. We're going to see human, fallen human beings being, being raised up by God to deliver groups of people out from under bondage because it's always in the heart of God to rescue. And the ultimate rescue will be God sending His Son into the world to save fallen humanity. If you read in our, in our Through the Bible reading, you read this morning in Luke 19 where Jesus said that He had come to seek and to save the lost. He's the ultimate redeemer. He's the ultimate rescuer. He's the ultimate one that's come to, to, uh, to provide redemption for humanity. So that being said, let's kind of cover an outline for the book. Um, the book of Judges has 21 chapters. It can be divided very naturally into three parts. The first part, the first two chapters, serve as a prologue and they kind of set the scene for the book. The, the next section, chapters three through chapter 16, those 14 chapters, they are the main body of the book. They're what the book is actually about. They're what the book gets its name from. And then the closing chapters, chapters 17 through 21, those chapters serve as kind of an epilogue and they sort of go back into the storyline and, and describe the condition of the people. And so we're just going to walk through. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, we're going to walk through the, the prologue, the first couple chapters, and we're going to then jump to something from the epilogue, and then we're going to spend the bulk of our time in the body looking at a couple of these deliverers and see what God might speak to our hearts and what God might want to do with our lives. So in the first two chapters, um, Samuel presents these truths in such a way as to connect the book of Judges with what's happened in the book of Joshua. As I mentioned before, children of Israel have entered the land. Collectively, they have defeated the 31 kingdoms within Canaan, and they have divided the land among the 12 tribes, and they have transitioned the authority from Joshua to the tribes, and then Joshua passes away. And here in the in the first two chapters, we learn what happens. And what we're going to see is we're going to see three reasons in these first two chapters why the nation was weakened, why there was spiritual confusion, why there was moral decline, and why there was this social unrest. The first reason is what, what I might call compromise, spiritual compromise. Take a look. Remember, they were told to after, the, after Joshua collectively conquered the land, each tribe was given the responsibility to take whatever strongholds were left and drive out whatever people were left. Take a look with me. We're going to start at verse 19 of chapter 1. We, we read, The Lord was with Judah, and they drove out the mountaineers, listen, but they could not drive out the inhabitants of the lowland. Look at verse 21. But the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites. Look over at verse 27. However, Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean. Look down at verse 29. Nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites. Verse 30. Nor did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Kitron. Verse 31, nor did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Akko. Look at verse 33, nor did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Bet Shemesh. Do you see the compromise? God has asked them to take the strongholds and drive out the inhabitants. Are they doing it? They're compromising. 
In some cases, their compromise, it says they did not. In others, says, it says they could not. They wouldn't lean into the Lord for what they needed in order to accomplish that. And as a result, those were left in the land. Now, Sam, Samuel periodically through the book provides commentary. So he's, he's giving sort of a running historical narrative of the things that happened, and then periodically he provides commentary. Take a look at verse 28. 28 reads this way, And it came to pass when Israel was strong that they put the Canaanites under tribute, but they did not drive them out. When they were strong, they put them under tribute. Now, what do you think happens when they're not strong? The whole rest of the book is going to tell the story of what happens to Israel when they're not strong. The, you've heard the phrase, the servant becomes the master. Those that they oppressed became their oppressors. Really, the whole story of the rest of the historical narrative of the Bible is those compromises that they made came back to get them. Have you found that to be true in your own life? Instead of dealing with something in your life that you're supposed to get out of your life, you kind of make a compromise, you make a covenant with it, you're going to keep it around, try to keep it in control, but then you find as you weaken, that thing strengthens. That's exactly what happened to them. A second thing that affected, that, ca that caused all the social dilemma in the, in the nation was a rejection of the Word of God. So first was a compromise, the second was a rejection of God's Word. Moses, the book of Deuteronomy is this, this a series of emotional messages by Pastor Moses to the people and, and all, finally a, a call placed upon the life of Joshua as the leader of the nation. And we're told that Joshua took the helm and Joshua succeeded because he did not let the book of the law depart from his mouth but he meditated on it day and night, and that's where he found his success. The book of Joshua ends with this tremendous appeal to the tribes. Joshua's that famous statement where Joshua says, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. You've got to make your decision. We are going to serve the Lord. And the tribal leader said, we're going to serve the Lord too, and they made that commitment. But here's what they failed to do. They failed to not... Let this book of the law depart from their mouth and meditate on it day and night so that they would find success. They, they rejected the word of God. Let's take a look at the text, how Samson, or Samuel presents it. Look at chapter 2, verse 7. We read, So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua who had seen the great works of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. So is that a positive statement? Yeah, it's awesome. These guys served the Lord while Joshua was there. And all those guys that served along with Joshua, and they served the Lord with them. Amazing. But now jump down to verse 10. Verse 10 says, When that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel didn't know the Lord, and they didn't know the work of the Lord. Whose fault is that? Whose fault is it if the generation behind us doesn't know the Lord and doesn't know the work of the Lord? Right? Well, in, in one sense, we'd say, well, it's their fault because we're all culpable for our, own for our own decisions, right? We bear responsibility. But in another sense, we'd certainly say, well, it's got to be the fault of the generation before us. <laughs> like what we're leaving to the generation behind us is our fault. And so Joshua, or, uh, Samuel points that out. He says, these guys failed to pass on who God was to the next generation, and the next generation failed to pick it up. And I think both of those things are true. Like we, we bear a responsibility to tell the generation behind us about who God is and the great things that God has done. But the generation behind us bears the responsibility of picking that up and saying, I'm going to tread my own course, and I'm going to find God to be faithful on my own. I, I can't think of a more boring Christianity if all of your experiences about God are from a book. That's a boring Christianity. 
All your experiences are the ones, I mean, I hope you're reading them in the Bible. I hope you're very familiar. But if, if, our, if, if they only come from Bible stories and from the stories of others, it's time for us to find our own stories. Time for us to step out and see what God wants to do with our life. The third reason that, that led to these things is found in verse 11. The children of Israel did evil in, in the sight of the Lord and served, the, served Baal, and they forsook the Lord. The third was idolatry. We've already talked about that in length. The fourth and final reason comes from the epilogue at the close of the book. So turn with me to the final chapter of the book of Judges, Judges chapter 21, and let's look at the final verse of the final chapter. What's happening here is Samuel is giving a summary statement to explain all that we've read about, all the, the challenging things that we read about in the book of Judges, all when we read about rape and murder, and, and j- attempted genocide, and constantly being oppressed by enemies, and civil unrest, and civil war. And you're going, how can these things be true of the people of God? Judges chapter 21, verse 25 explains it. We read, in those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Here's the problem. We call this, today we call this relativism or existentialism. It's the idea that there is no moral absolute, there is no right or wrong. Every person makes a decision of what is right for them based upon the circumstances that they find themselves in. It's very interesting that the same people that will espouse that kind of a philosophy will also get upset when you express what they call your truth. The young people are familiar with that phrase, your truth. It's a very interesting phrase. There's only one truth. There's truth and there's not truth. There's not your truth and my truth. There might be your perspective on the truth and my perspective on the truth, but there's only one truth. Just as this idea of relativism or existentialism, this is not a new, so, so anybody that's spouting that because I, you think that you're, you, you've evolved and, you know, you've evolved out of, out of, you know, the darkness of the ages in the past and I'm, I'm more modern now and a modern thinker, you're thinking like people thought 3,300 years ago and they wrecked their world. It's not a healthy way to think. So here we have it. We have a condition that's painted for us by Samuel it's a condition of, of um, national weakness, spiritual confusion, moral decline, social unrest. It's caused by compromising in relationship with God, rejecting the word of God, getting involved in idolatry, and espousing a philosophy that says, I can do what's ever right in my own eyes. There are no absolutes. That's the picture that's painted by Samuel. But now we come to the body of the book. Here's what the book, all of that just paints a picture so that we can see what God does in that setting. One of the things that I think it's very important for us to grasp as followers of Jesus is that in one sense, it is irrelevant what the world around us is doing. Absolutely irrelevant because it doesn't change who we're called to be or what we're called to do. It makes absolutely no difference. If the, wh- whatever the world's doing, if the world is, is turning and making some positive strides, does that change who God's called you to be? Does it change what God's called you to do? If the world's turning and making negative strides, does it change who God's called you to be? Does it change what God's called you to do? So there's this bleak backdrop that's painted by Samuel so that he can speak to us about what God does in the midst of that. And so the body of this book, chapters 3 through chapter 16, is going to tell the story of 12 individuals. And these are individuals who are called by God and equipped by God in order to redeem and rescue the people from oppression. Now, of these 12 individuals, six of them we know very little about. They're mentioned Um, We get a little bit of of detail, not a lot. The other six, their story is presented with all of this color and drama around it. 
it's really easy to get caught up in the color and the drama and forget that the color and the drama is there to remind us of the call of God and the equipping of God upon this individual. So in the time that we have left, I just want to point out a few of these guys to you. And again, it, you can read through all their stories in those 14 chapters. But let's get started in chapter 3. We'll look at the first guy. Chapter 3, verse 7. Here's our first deliverer. Uh, one more thing I have to say, and that is there's a cycle that's repeated over and over in the book. The people sin, the people suffer, the people cry out to God or supplicate God, and God sends a deliverer or saves them. That, that is repeated six times in the book. They do evil, they go into bondage, they cry out to God, God delivers them, rinse and repeat. And that happens through the book. Um, chapter three is the first time, verse seven, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They served Baal and Ashtoreth. The Lord sent, verse 8, this guy by the name of Cushan. He was king of Mesopotamia. And uh, verse 9 says, when the children cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer, a guy by the name of Othniel, Caleb's brother. And the spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he delivered the people from Cushan. Now, Mesopotamia is a massive land space north of Israel, would have been a huge army that had come in. They'd seen the weakness of the nation. They came to take Israel's resources. And the people cry out to God. And God raises up Othniel, the brother, the younger brother of Caleb, and God's spirit comes on him. And without giving a lot of detail, he delivers the nation. Here's the first thing I want you to note. Although he's Caleb's younger brother, he's not young. Remember Caleb? Caleb was 85. He comes to Joshua. He says, I'm as strong now. <laughs> like, like, remember, he's an old man. He wants to take the hill. This guy's not, a, a, this is not a kid. This is not like David's story against Goliath or, or Paul choosing Timothy to be on his team. This is an old guy and, and God wants to do a work. So, so here's our first application. It's for our old guys. God wants to use you. God's not done with you. Now, how he uses you is different. I can tell you how he doesn't want to use you. He doesn't want to use you by you getting together with a bunch of other old people and complaining about everything that's wrong with young people. Okay, I'm pretty sure that's not how God wants to use you. But if you want to get together and use all the experience that you have to encourage and pour into and supply for young people to serve the Lord, that's probably a good idea. Let's move on before I get mugged in the parking lot. The second judge, verse 12, we're told of a guy by the name of Ehud. And Ehud, it's an interesting story. I'll tell you the story for time's sake. A king by the name of Eglon had put Israel under tribute. Eglon was an enormously fat individual. That the story tells us that. Why? To draw your attention. And we're told that God raises up Ehud. And we're told one thing about Ehud. He's left-handed. Now, that is either something that would be looked upon at that time as a weakness or as a unique gift. One way or another, it's pointed out. This is either people going, oh, left-handed. You know if you're left-handed, even in the modern world, it's challenging being a left-handed person in a right-handed world. It's just challenging. Do you know what the word ambidextrous means? It means two right hands. That's, what it li that's literally what the word means, two right hands. So if you're left-handed, you, you feel like that. So it's either something that's, a, that's, a, that's considered a detriment or it's a unique gift. But here's what God does. God calls Ehud, and because he's left-handed, he's able to hide his sword in a way that they wouldn't normally look for it. And he goes to bring a gift to Eglon, and he takes his, his dagger, and he drives it into Eglon's belly, and he's so fat that the blade gets completely covered by his fat, and I don't know, Ehud somehow gets his hand out, and he escapes, and when the king is killed, the troops are weakened, and Israel's rescued. Why all that color? Because God's looking for people that maybe look down upon 
or maybe have unique skill sets that you might not sure how those could ever be used for the kingdom. God's looking to use those. The next character, uh, Deborah. Deborah's a, a, a woman prophetess that God uses in a tremendous way with a guy by the name of Barak. Um, there's a wonderful part of that story, color that's given to the story, where Sisera, the general of the army that had been attacking, it was the Canaanites led by Jabin, and, and Sisera flees after their armies begin to be defeated, and he hides in a tent, and a woman, he's exhausted, his adrenaline starts to settle, she gives him some warm milk, he falls asleep, and she drives a tent peg through his head. But again, why is that color in the story? To remind us of who God wants. God wants to use this woman, and Barak was a man with very little faith. And God wants to use him. So you go, well, I'm a person of very little faith. Awesome. God wants to use you. You go, wait, that qualifies me? Absolutely. Little faith qualifies you. Jesus said you didn't need much of it. You just need to put it in the right place. Let's look at one more and we'll wrap. In chapter 6, in chapter 6, we read about the children of Israel being oppressed by the Midianites. And the Midianites come from the south, they come from the area like of Saudi Arabia today, and they march. And, and during certain seasons, they would march on Israel and they would devour, they would burn up all of Israel's crops. They were keeping them completely oppressed. And as a result, the Israelites, the small crops that they were to gather early before the Midianite troops came, they would take up into the hills, they would go into caves, and, and we, we meet a character by the name of Gideon, and he's threshing wheat in a wine press. Now, to thresh wheat, you need airflow, but he's in a place with no airflow because he's scared, his life's threatened. And in that setting, when he's hiding from the Midianites, God comes to him, and God says to Gideon, Gideon, mighty man of valor. God's not teasing him. He's not saying, oh, look at you, chicken. He's, he's saying to him, Gideon, I'm going to do a work in your life. And he says, and he, then he makes him his promise. He says, go in this might that is yours, and you're going to deliver the Midianites. And Gideon's story is that fascinating story where, where thousands of people come to Gideon's side to go do battle against the Midianites. And then God speaks to Gideon, and he says, you need to tell the people whoever's afraid to go home. That, that actually came, that was actually part of the law. Every time Israel was to go to war, the priests were to come up and they were to say, anybody buy a new house? I bought a new house. You need to go home and take care of your house. Anybody recently get married? I just got married. Go home, take care of your family. Anybody here afraid? We're afraid. You guys need to get out of here. We don't need fearful people going into the battle. I mean, that was part of the law. It's Deuteronomy chapter 20. He tells the people, if you're afraid, go home. Of the 33,000 people, 23,000 go home. It's left with 10,000 people. And then God tells them, go tell the people to all, all drink from, the, from the, the water source there. There's a place called Gideon Spring today in Israel. You go and everybody gets a picture of themselves, you know, lapping the water, right? And, and so you just watch. Watch all the people that put their face in the water. Watch the people that drink water. Doesn't give commentary as to why. And then 300 people... He says, that 300, that's your army, Gideon. And Gideon with 300 people go out against the army of the Midianites that's described as more than the sand of the sea. And they go out into the battle with a torch covered by a clay pot at night. And then they break the clay pot to make noise so everyone knows where they are. And then they turn a flashlight on. So in case they didn't hear the noise, they can see the light. Brilliant defense strategy. And God supernaturally brings victory. The next character, I told you we'd do this last one and I lied. But I didn't tell you that lying was one of the problems within this book, so I'm going to get away with it. The, the, other, the other character, the most famous character in the book of Judges is who? Samson. And Samson is a man whose who's, his story is a tragic story because he's gifted as a deliverer. He has more gifts than any character in the entire Old Testament. But his personal compromise made it that he affected very little change for the kingdom of God. So what we have here in, this, in the book of Judges as we wrap, 
The book of Judges paints for us a very dark picture. It's a picture that is not unfamiliar to us. It's a picture that when we turn the news on or whatever, whatever information sources that we, re, we receive from, we think, you know what, this, this sounds a lot like this. Weakness, social unrest, moral de- decline, spiritual confusion. And in the midst of that, God tells 12 stories about 12 individuals, very unlikely individuals, that he puts a call of God on their life and he provides for them what they need in order to affect change in those circumstances. And that's what we want God to do, isn't it? That's what we want. We say, Lord, I need you to do that in my home. I need you to do that in our community. I need you to do that from any ministry that that you would have birth out of this place. Lord, we need you to put a call on our life and we need you to equip us with everything that is necessary in order to fulfill that call.